This month's Where Did the Road Go is brought to you by six amazing individuals. Greg Ross, Bill Luminati, Allison Cook, Super Inframan, 36 Dingo, and Michael Frisky. Thank you all for helping to make this show possible. And if you'd like to help out, become a patron at wheredidtheroadgo.com. It's only $3 a month for lots of extra content. Transmission start. Welcome to Where Did the Road Go? Join us as we wander off the path and explore lost history, consciousness, the paranormal, unexplained mysteries, alternative thought, and much more. We are present on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com. Now here is your host, Soraya. Welcome to this edition of Where Did the Road Go? And tonight I have with me Mr. Matt Festa. Hello, my darlings. Who uh, has awesome art at uh, Tiamat's Garden on both Facebook and uh, Instagram and Blue Sky. Is it under Tiamat's Garden? Yep, it's on there at all of them. Okay, and has also designed the artwork for my autobiography, the first part of my autobiography anyway, which hopefully will be out this year. I was hoping by May. I can finally show the cover. Yes, yes. So people have seen the cover, and people are are blown away by the cover. So, um, yes, you 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 do good. Me and, and art good. And then I uh, <laughs> exactly. And then I I, I kind of scrolled around and dug under some virtual rocks and found Rosian. Hello. And How are you? It's been a while since you've been on. I know. I think the last time you were on it was Josh and Greg. Yeah, yeah. And I bugged you for that one. I'm like, yeah. hey, let's do a show together because I don't feel like doing one, and let's get Josh on. And you were like, yeah, let's do that. Are you sure you want to do this? And I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> was it Greg too? Was that the other person we had? Yeah, it was Josh and Greg. Yeah. And it was a lot of fun because those guys are both big heroes of mine. And they're they always say like, don't meet your heroes because they might not be the people that you that you expect them to be. And they are. They're, they're right. They are what they are. They're cool people. You know, you just go up and talk to them. Hey, what's going on? You know, and that, that's just how they are. So it was a lot of fun just to hang out with them again. And, and you have for years done the project archivist, uh, podcast mm-hmm. and have sort been of been on, on hiatus. hiatus. Yeah. Yeah. I, I did a show over the summer. You know, it was me and my buddy. We hung out together with my buddy Gary and we did, a. We did one, and then um, I've got a biblical jackass show that I'm. I've pretty much got set to go, and I might do a, a fast food follies one of stupid crap that happens at uh, fast food mm. places and stuff. And then I've got the biblical jackass show that I used to do every year, which is stupid things that people do in the name of religion. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm, I've got that one set to go. It's just been a matter of tying the people together and saying, "What's your day off? What's your day off? Okay, this is my day off. What? Okay, and just yeah. trying to get everybody together, and then sitting down and pressing the record button again. And I, I don't know. I'm getting the itch. It's just a matter of how often I'll be able to do it, or how many episodes I'm going to put out on a regular basis and stuff like that. But it's it's, it's been a nice break. But you know, I just, every once in a while, I'm kind of like, "Hey, this sounds like something I might want to cover." So you know, yeah. we'll see what happens. And 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 I and I do have to say, if it wasn't for you, I would never have met Jeff Ritz. Oh, rest in peace, good man. Yes. Yeah, he was. Uh, yeah, he was a big, big influence on me, and he was a good friend of mine as well. He was one of those people I could just call up, and we would just talk about guitars or Star Wars or, <laughs> yeah. you know, like his Darth Vader suit that he had or, or something like that. We would, <laughs> you know, we would, if we saw him on, we'd be like, hey, you, you around? And we'd just call him up, and we'd just, you know, just BS with him for however long or whatever. And then when I heard he passed away, I was like, whoa, that, that hit hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I uh I I because I missed uh the the Paratopia episodes I never I never heard them um and the first time I heard of Jeff was you did like a three part with him maybe or a two part with him yeah I did a few shows with him and uh, just talking about his experiences and I'm listening to it going I need to talk to this guy who is this guy and I messaged you and you're like yeah I don't know if he's still doing paranormal stuff but here's his contact info mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah he bounced in and out of it. You know, yeah, he was yeah. in it for a while, then he'd bounce out. He was a, he had a lot of very peculiar experiences and very interesting viewpoints. And he, um, I didn't agree with every, me and him disagreed sometimes, but on the whole, I really respected his ideas because I respected where he was coming from, even if I didn't respect some of the stuff, didn't, I didn't agree with some of the yeah, stuff that he yeah. said. But it never was like, I, I don't I don't agree with you and you're dumb. Well, I don't agree with you and you're dumb. You know, it was never like that. It was kind of like, well, I don't know if I believe that, but all right, you know. Right. And right. him and Jeremy Feeney, you know, they were the same way. Um, I, I, would list, I was listening to them before they did Paratopia, when they left the one show that they did. I can't remember what it was now. They started doing Paratopia, which was supposed to be kind of a spoof comedy kind of thing. 
And it just didn't work that way. Yeah. I remember talking yeah. to both of them off the air. They're like, we wanted to be funny, but we can't be funny. You know, they're like, we want to, but we just can't. We can't make fun of this because it, it annoys us so much. So, <laughs> I don't know. Don't Sometimes they were yourself. still funny. <laughs> oh, they were funny. Yeah. Yeah, they were. There, 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 so, was, there was one I listened to recently where uh, he had, uh, Jeremy had a friend of his on who was in, it wasn't really in a religious cult. That's how he sold it. But she just had a father who thought he was like a prophet. And uh, she's that she's happens. saying something like, uh, "What's the, what's the American version of Anglican?" And Jeremy goes, "Anglican." And she goes, "No, no, no. There's another word for it." And he goes, "Pelican." And like, <laughs> and, I, and I'm listening, and like, I'm about to go back because I'm like, "Did he just say pelican?" And Jeff goes, "Hey, wait. Did you just say pelican?" And I'm like, "Thank you." <laughs> <laughs> so there was some really funny stuff in there at times. Yeah, they, they had some funny ones. The other thing is. What I liked about them is they weren't afraid to take anybody off. Sure, like the people sure. that I didn't like or the things that I called out and thought was weird, they generally were the same way. And it's, you know, if they if they thought something, I have to watch my mouth, but if they thought something smelled funny or whatever, they weren't afraid to go out and be like, hey, yeah. you're wrong. And, yeah. and you're and you're selling a line of you're selling a line of crap. And, you know, and I was I really respected that. And you know, they didn't care when everybody else was was climbing up the uh, the whole hybrids. Um, oh yeah, yeah. You know, all, there was all kind there was all kinds of stuff that they were involved in, and they weren't afraid to walk in. I remember they were talking about how they went into a UFO conference, and there were people on stage talking about the Space Brothers and all these crazy narratives. And Jeremy was like, "How do you know all this? What do you you know? What are you basing this on?" And they were like, "Well, what are you here for? Why are you here if you're if you're not into this stuff?" And they were like, "That's a good question." So they got up and left. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I was like, I don't need to go to any of these conventions and stuff because they were right. So, but uh, Matt. <laughs> so Matt, Matt, yes. Matt, Matt has uh, was Matt, reading Matt, 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 Matt. Matt. Uh, Matt was reading a book called Jeff: The Strange Tale of an Extra Extra Special Talking Mongoose. This is the same book, yes. right? Yes. Okay, by Christopher Joseph. I'm not sure how I pronounce it. I think it might be Joseph. Okay. J-O-S-I-F-F-E. Yes, and I have this book, but I have not had time to read it, but you have read it. And uh, so we're going to talk about this book tonight, and uh, it's something that Rojan's not totally familiar with, which I think works in our favor, because we may miss things that people who are not familiar with the whole Jeff the Mongoose thing may not know, because you, you and I, Matt, are familiar with it. Yeah, and I had actually first heard about Jeff from Where Did the Road Go? I don't even remember what episode it was on. You weren't even talking about poltergeists in general or something. Just, I think it might have been um, Josh Kutchin had mentioned how like it's the really strange, weird cases that interest him. And he mm -hmm. threw out Jeff the Mongoose. And as soon as I heard that, I'm like, wait, Jeff the Mongoose? <laughs> it's like, just the name of it is like so absurd on its face that it caught my attention. Yeah. Yeah, and it's such a classic poltergeist case. It's, it's always been one of my favorites. And this dates back to what? What was the time period? Well, it the whole thing lasted for quite a few years. It initially, at least when they say it began, was like around the nineteen early 1930s, I think. But like the more, at least the way Joseph explains it in the book, like the deeper you get into it and the more you probe things, you can see like earlier traces of it happening even before that like they talk about the start of the case being like when they actually begin conversing with this jeff oh. self-identified jeff mongoose thing but like then as like they look more and more into it they talk about like strange noises and growlings and banging and like jeff you know air quote learning to talk for like the years and years before any of this started so like it's really vague as to just how long this phenomena was going on. Well, well, and I mean that's pretty typical of poltergeist phenomena. Okay, it's let me interject for what. Okay, you're, I'm a little confused. I think I know what's going on, but you're talking about a poltergeist and you're talking about a talking mongoose. So, or were so these two one and the same, they, or is they, this they, like they, the Kool Aid uh, Man busting through the wall? Or <laughs> you want to try oh, yeah. to explain that? So, good lord, how do you even explain this? Like, it's Tossing easiest... a lot of things out at one time right here. 
I guess it's easiest to like just think of the entire phenomena in terms of a poltergeist case, because like as Soraya has talked about at length, that's how so much of these different just phenomena in general can be grouped together. Yeah. Excuse me. But like the main crux of what was going on at this, it all takes place on the Isle of Man in the UK at a small farm in, um, what was it called? Cashin's Gap, I think is the name of the town. It's like, there's like three different names used for the region. There's like, uh, Dorlish Cashin, Cashin's Gap. It's that region in the middle of the Isle of Man. So like, it's this one family living on a farm and like a plethora of other paranormal poltergeist type activity starts to happen. But the crux of all of it is at one point, like I said, in the early 1930s, they begin like literally conversing, having actual verbal conversations with an entity that called itself Jeff, G-E-F, and referred to itself as being a mongoose. Yeah. So uh, did, did anyone, I don't think anyone actually saw the mongoose directly, did they? No, quite a few people did. Oh, All did of they? the family okay. did. Yeah. Um, that's the other thing, because like multiple, and this is one of the things that we can talk about later with the movie that recently came out that like really annoyed me because I watched it right before we did start a recording. Like it tries to portray it as like this whole huge, just like hoax and people being gullible and naive. But like there was so much that like actually like people physically interacting with this entity, creature, whatever you want to call it, including like I'm trying to remember some of like the specific things like Margaret, who was the mother of the family, like had not only like seen and touched Jeff, but like Jeff allowed her to to, like actually feel inside his mouth and like feel how sharp his teeth were oh um yeah like other people like completely unrelated to the family like just kids that lived in town saw jeff walking around at one point like there were multiple people that like actually saw this animal for lack of a better term that was supposedly jeff and like like it was, in a sense, easy to tell that it was Jeff, because like while he refers to himself as being a mongoose, there's not really any one specific animal that fits the description of like what people were seeing. I'm envisioning a Furby. <laughs> So the details would like vary slightly, but in general, the way Jeff was described was from nose to tail a about a little bit bigger than a squirrel, very long, really bushy tail, yellow colored fur with a black tip at the end of the tail, a sort of uh, blunt, almost human or simian like face. The hands were like proportionally very large for the body and like also looked like hands, not like paws. Mm. Um, trying to think of what else. So it's more like a ferret crossed with a raccoon or something. Kind of like before he settled on calling himself a mongoose, there were like a couple different other animals like a ferret, a polecat and that that he would refer to himself as or compare himself to. But like, the thing that I drew a conclusion of, like, he's yellow, he has a short face, he has the black tip of the tail, he has a long, bushy tail, he talks in a really high-pitched voice. He's not a mongoose, he's a Pikachu. <laughs> well, you, you know, and I... <laughs> when we're looking at that type of a thing, where you have poltergeist activity, and that poltergeist activity manifests as something very physical, I mean, I suspect this is what a lot of Bigfoot encounters are. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, but Bigfoot, well, maybe. No, I, th- and I, I should actually watch what I say. But you usually don't have encounters of a Bigfoot like talking to you in a poltergeist like no. faction. No, no, like, no, no. Kind of like teasing you. But. Unless you want to get into the really strange cases of like the Bigfoot habituation. Yeah, or the, the telepathy uh, cases. I'm just saying it's it's a variation on, on that sort of theme. Like, yeah, it's it's mm-hmm. the trickster kind of thing. Yeah, it's, because this sounds very trickster. Oh, yes. you know, like it, this this sounds like something that's like I, I don't know, but it 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 kind of presents itself as like yeah, you, you th- go, go tell everybody that you're talking to a talking mongoose <laughs> that uh, moves stuff around with its mind. Here, want to play with my teeth? Go tell people that you just <laughs> played with a mongoose that let you play with its teeth. I mean, that just seems like bringing up Ritzman, Ritzman would have experiences like this where things would would mess with him and be like, yeah, go tell people. No one's going to believe you. And Right, right. I mean, if I were having a conversation with a talking mongoose, I'm pretty sure I wouldn't be telling a whole lot of people about it. (laughs) 
Yeah, the the, uh, the sort of uh, focus of this was the daughter, right? It was. So, again, we should probably just like start clarifying some terms yeah, for yeah, the yeah. audience before we get too deep into things. Like I said, it was happening on the Isle of Man. It was a family that weren't Manx themselves. They moved there from London, I think, somewhere else in England. Um, it was the father, James, the mother, Margaret. Vori was the daughter. They had several other children, but they had all like moved on and like were out doing their own things at this point. So it was just the three of them living at the farm. The daughter was, for a long period of it, kind of the focus of Jeff's attention, like to the point where what the locals would call it, the Dalby spook, was like a term that was equally applied to the farm itself, to Jeff and to Vori. I'm not sure how, I think it's Vori, Vori, I'm not sure how to pronounce her name. Okay, okay, interesting. And so, again, some of the things that like make this such an interesting and unique case to study is like, There are these commonalities, but like also Jeff himself, how he would present and his personality would change like quite dramatically over the years. Initially, like when he first started overtly talking to them, he was a very like aggressive, antagonistic force, like threatening to kill them even. Mm. Like as they more like, I guess, grew accustomed and accepting of one another's presence, like he settled into more of just this playful tricksterish type entity that would still just like like to linger around the house and play within like just playfully annoy them like talking and singing throughout the night and keeping them up and everything but like he would also depending on who he was interacting with kind of mirror aspects of their personality because like when he was more commonly associated with vori he had that more playful childlike demeanor when he would spend more time with James, it, like he would develop this excessively intimate nature with Margaret to like the point of even saying like really suggestive things to her. Um, he's like everything about this was like so consistent and malleable at the same time. And again, like spread over so many years as opposed to like most poltergeist things, which like last like, you know, weeks to months. The, well, you know, yes yes and no. I mean, some of them last a little longer, but usually once the stress in the situation is um, relieved via the poltergeist, yeah, they tend, they tend to fade out. Maybe because there was so much focus on this one. Does, does it talk about at all, like, if this girl had any abuse issues or any... Any reason why she would be really overly stressed and, and maybe uh, creating a poltergeist? In regards to any potential abuse or just other stressful situations that Vori herself may have been under at the time, and again, this is like spread over many years that this was happening, there are some accusations that were made at one point of abuse against her that were like there's very little documentation of obviously something from this long ago but like all things considered it seems like those accusations were for the most part baseless but at the same time when you look at all of particularly the father's behavior you can really get a sense of like the specific kind of overbearing jerk that he was that would like really make a childhood difficult like to the point of when the different investigators go there he would like literally forbid her from ever being alone with anybody else including them or just basically anyone that would come around Whenever they were there, even if they were like addressing questions directly to her, he would constantly be the one talking over everyone else, talking instead of them, like just so needlessly overbearing and domineering a personality that like you can tell how incredibly difficult it would be living with that. And you can see that in a lot of just the way the different investigators would like document her like mannerisms and behavior, how like sullen she would be, how quiet she would be around him, Mm -hmm. like how she would light up whenever one of the things that like initially made her really happy because she had like this really intense interest in anything just engineering or technology related. And at one point I forget which of the investigators it was, but they gave her a camera to try and photograph Jeff. And she was just like, so enamored with this device but like again it was something that like the father kind of took over and like wanted to use it as like just part of his own little investigation and setting up these little camera traps and whatever to try and get a picture of jeff yeah that could definitely be be a cause of stress like without abuse 
in, in the mm-hmm. obvious form. I mean, I would think that would be enough to have her really repress a lot of a lot of stuff that could manifest as poltergeist energy. But at the same time, it's also like not just her because there were so many different things pointing towards Margaret, the mother that like <coughs> not in terms of like her being under stress and everything, but like just her having so much phenomena around her in general, like mm. so many people documented her having various other psychic abilities so many people referring to her including jeff as a witch and like so many other things like that yeah it's like it's fascinating because like the more you dig into this case as hilariously bizarre as it is there is like so much else going on under the surface Hmm. Um, so okay other okay so so to be clear now you have poltergeist incidents and tapas which we haven't quite got into yet but you have poltergeist like incidents happening you have the talking Pikachu um, um, devil ferret itself. And then you have the father um, who's trying to conduct his own paranormal investigations and stuff like that. So did this entity like pick people in the family specifically to latch onto or like, did it really latch onto the daughter or did it, did it have anybody in the family that it partic- particularly like, like show favoritism for or talk to more or, or just mess with things more when they were around or something like that? Or did this whole thing affect the entire family? And to be clear, you have stated that other people outside of the family did see the talking, the talking uh, death mongoose, correct? Death mongoose? Yes. <laughs> well, what death mongoose, um, double beaver, <laughs> man, bear, pig. <laughs> <Double> beaver. <laughs> I know I'm being silly about it, but I'm trying to, I'm trying to assemble all this into my head in right. a coherent kind of time frame because to be clear though th- this was a talking ferret but it also was responsible for poltergeist like activity at the same time so does the par- does it, does does the furby move stuff with its mind or like how so, how you've got there's there's all kinds of branches going off of this one thing and it all comes from this from this death ferret right yeah so in terms of like the reason i keep calling it a poltergeist like there was so much other phenomena happen like they would like they'd have things you know all of the typical stuff like stones being thrown inside the house like uh what's a radio safe way to describe this one holes in the matchboarding on the walls that jeff would urinate through at them oh that's a new one I didn't hear that's a that. new one yeah, yeah. That's a new one. <laughs> Wow. Okay. Um, he would like steal things, not just from the house, but like around the town and like leave them in different places, almost like app warts. Like, and that's the thing, like so much of this, you can not attribute to stuff like app warts or other like psychical type phenomena like that. But like when Jeff would describe them, it would always be in like very physical terms relative to a creature of his size. Like at one point during one of the investigations, They had Jeff describe the lobby of, or not lobby, it was a mansion or something, but like the front room of this mansion that was in a nearby town. And like he described it in incredible exacting detail, a building that like none of the family had ever been to. But when they asked Jeff how he was able to see that, he described having to go there by like clinging onto the underside of a bus and riding all the way there. Mm. Yeah, I'm trying to... So, so because, how, how long into this before the mongoose part of it started making itself apparent? So the mongoose itself started talking, like I said, I want to say sometime around 31, maybe early 1930s. The things they would talk about before that, I think were going on at least a couple of years prior of just like the various noises and banging in the house, like growling type noises, things being moved. And like later on, whether I can't remember if this was like Jeff's explanation or whether it was something they put together on their own of saying it was Jeff learning how to talk. And like these other noises that you were making were like his initial attempts to imitate speech. Hmm. I mean, it it, kind of sounds like a tulpa being formed. That's what I'm that's. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. That's exactly what I was. That's why I'm asking all these questions. The more I'm thinking about it, I'm like, this seems like it's either a tulpa being formed or something that was brought in, if you want to go into the realm of Wu, um, like a spirit or something like that <coughs> that has brought itself in because, and it's just it's just messing with this family again, you know. It's you know, but how the, the 
the whole presenting itself as a mongoose thing is is kind of the weird, you know, the weird spanner in the works. But then again, when you think about cases like Mothman, um, Bigfoot sightings, as you said earlier, it's the really weird cases aren't just, yes, I saw a Mothman. It was, I saw a Mothman and there was lights over in the trees and right, these things right. present themselves as all kinds of different activity wrapped into one. And there's always a red herring in it. And in this case, it seems to be the talking mongoose. Like Jeff's so, own explanations get way more woo than that. And like, it's Jeff himself is like fascinating, but like also so trickerous. You can't trickerous. That's not a word. <laughs> it is now. <laughs> That's a great it word. It is now. <laughs> I'm adding it to the Urban Dictionary. Hold on. <laughs> He's so mm. trickerish illicit that like you can't <laughs> you can't rely on his own explanations, even though he is like the primary source on all of this. Yeah. Because well, yeah, Jeff would describe aspect. himself like in various points as an earthbound spirit, as the reincarnation of a yogi, as a spirit that decided to take the form of a mongoose, as a literal mongoose that learned how to talk. Like he would give so many conflicting explanations. This is a fay having fun at everybody else's expense. Yeah. This was this was a mm-hmm. fay that took a bet and said, "Here, hold my beer," and, you know, or something. <laughs> that's this. This sounds very fay fay oriented. Oh, that's, definitely. That's every, yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm I'm just trying to piece things together into, you know, some kind of form in my head. And like. So they would even try to, like, test and explore some of these various explanations, like with the one of him being the reincarnation of a yogi. They're like, okay, say something in, you know, Hindi or whatever other language relative to the region he said he was from. I can't remember specifically. And, like, Jeff would try saying things in those other languages that, like, when they checked and tried to verify what he was saying they're like no this is just utter gibberish like if you really want to squint at it you could say like maybe that was a word but like no this isn't a language but at the same time jeff was a polyglot he could talk in english i think he mentioned some other things in like french he could he spoke uh, quite a few manx idioms lo- local to the island but like all of the various languages that he could speak were languages that James himself knew. So like that, again, goes back to like, is this something directly related to him or the family in general that he's pulling from them or was a Talpa manifested from them or just right. only able to like reflect what they already had within them? Right, right. Which I'm sure also added to hoax speculation. Mm-hmm. As as it naturally does. The problem with mm-hmm. the crying in a hoax is you have to explain all of it, and I haven't seen any explanations that that explain all of it as being a hoax. And like there was so much almost by design that would make it difficult to like verify anything or even explore anything because like people would see this mongoose people would hear jeff talking but almost no one saw the animal and heard it talking at the same time while they were looking at it Mm. like the others in the village like i said i think one of the prominent ones were like two like schoolboys or something that saw jeff walking through a field they like never heard it say anything. Other people, like so many people, heard Jeff talking, but, like weren't able to see him at the time. The voice would invariably be coming from like behind or within the walls. And like even when people could hear Jeff talking, they would like very clearly hear this incredibly rapid, high pitched voice. But, like so few people could like actually understand what Jeff was saying to the point where James would be interpreting what he was saying for them. Oh. So like at the one time you like you could argue that like, OK, they're just hearing a noise and he's making up this dialogue. But at the same time, you could argue that like he's just familiar with this incredibly weird way that Jeff speaks, because like everyone that did hear it described it as like basically an incredibly high pitched vocalization that would come from an animal that size. Like, you know how like sh- shrill, like a squirrel chirping is. Yeah. Huh. It it makes I could go into helium voice in my head, but go ahead. <laughs> it, 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 you know what it makes me think of? It makes me think of like the, Seth, the Seth material, where Jane's you know voices and mannerisms would change in such a weird way. Mm-hmm. So okay, so what you're saying is when people would hear Jeff talk, would they, would they actually see words coming out of? They, when they would look over and see Jeff, and they would see the creature's mouth moving, et cetera, and they would hear things coming out of its mouth, or no? No. 
Or what they heard no, coming out of his thing. mouth like, would be high pitched. That's the thing. Like if people were to see Jeff, it wouldn't be while he was talking. If they heard him talking more often than not, it would just be a voice coming from another room or behind a wall. It was like incredibly rare. I think it might have only been the family that like would actually see him while he was talking. Again, this sounds like fake tricksterism or telepathy mm-hmm. of some form, possibly. It's, it's, um, it sounds like there's a lot going on. And I wonder, too, if there's something about the area that may lend itself to more uh, energetic sort of stuff. That's another thing that the book gets into. Like, even prior to the family going there, it was considered uh, not necessarily haunted, but like a very... like Energy spot? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And, like, also they dug into some records and, like, found, like, some local rumors that were true about, like, murders that happened on the site. So, like, oh. there's so much else. Like, like basically every paranormal thing you could just throw at a dartboard of various topics happened at some point and, like, is in some way related to the whole Jeff phenomena. Well, at least no UFOs or lights or anything that I could think of. Yeah, that was going to be my question. <laughs> Yeah, that's where I was going next, with their lights and or orbs or anything like that floating around. I mean, I might just be forgetting details. Like Soraya said, it's a fairly substantial book. Yeah, you've been reading so it for a while. So how long did this go on for? It The whole thing lasted for quite a few, like eight years or so, I think. Don't quote me on that exactly, but like that kind of range. But even then, like the date as to when it ends is kind of vague. Because like they would talk about when Jeff would like stop appearing and talking to them. But there were still things happening around the farm, like stuff being moved, stones, throwing various other bangings and noises. So, like, it's not like there was a specific end date. It just sort of, like, tapered off. So did the mongoose just disappear or does it does it ever say what happened to it? Yeah, at some point it just, like, stopped appearing in that form and, like, the various other phenomena related to it just sort of, like, lessened and lessened over the years. Which is standard so, for poltergeists. yeah. When you say that form, did it did it show up as some other kind of creature, or was it always just the mongoose? Very early on, I think this was, yeah, this was after Jeff had started talking, and this is like one of the first really sort of incredibly bizarre monkey wrenches thrown into the whole thing that caught my attention. James was doing something in the house, I can't remember what specifically, but was looking out the window And he saw a cat like just walking through the property. He describes it as I can't remember what specific type of short tailed cat, at least the way it sounded to me was like something similar to a lynx, kind of a little bit smaller, though, like still this like, you know, large short tailed cat just wandering through. He's like, what is that? And then like later talking to Jeff, Jeff said, yeah, that was me, like a creature that looks nothing like any of the other descriptions of Jeff. Hmm. It sounds like a mulk, if you know what that is. No, um, I do not. Mulk are like these these fairy cats. Um, like a Chash- like a Shashire cat would be an example of kind of like what a mulk is. Okay. You don't hear a whole heck of a lot about them in folklore. Uh, um, Butcher writes about them in Dresden Files books. There's there's uh, mulks that pop up in there. But they're these weird, like, fa- and again, I'm not, I, I don't know if I'm a person that believes in fa- uh, the fae as an actual thing or whatever but i do i am fascinated by the folklore and the things that are related to them sure and you have um these you have these things like i have a friend of mine who has something like it that pops up in her life every once in a while but they're like they're they're for lack of a better term they're these these like fairy cats or fake cats and they usually just show up and cause problems or kill people (laughs) (laughs) but that's pretty much what they do and there's not a whole heck of a lot about them um, but it does sound like something like that. Like the stories that I've read of Malks, like they have um they have a habit of of just showing up and causing things like that. In in my youth, I, I used to have um when I was much, 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 much younger, we used to live on a farmhouse and we had this black dog, but it was about as it looked like a German shepherd crossed with a great dane. It was really big. It almost it wasn't quite wolf like because it had really short hair in the back. But this thing would kind of prowl our property, and we'd have all kinds of crazy things happen whenever this thing came around. The phone would ring. The lights would blink on and off. Um, mm. the, I remember the garbage disposal just randomly kicked on at one time, um, and it did the whole fork in the, thing, the sink went, you know, did the whole fork dance thing and all that. But whenever this thing would pop up, there, there's more to the story, but I don't want to go into it right now because it's a long story. But we would have – I mean, it certainly didn't talk to us or anything like that. 
but it would definitely make its presence known and it, it would stand up on its hind legs. It would rear up and kind of walk on its hind legs for a little bit and then it would lunch itself forward because it could only walk for so long. But it used to come up and peer in our windows and it, 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 it had, I don't want to say it had glowing eyes, but for lack of a better term, it did. It was probably the light in the house reflecting off of its eyes like you do with a deer or any other kind of animal. Well, well I, th- um, I think I know what we're going to talk about on our Patreon segment. Mm-hmm. Oh, if you want to, I can tell the story again. Okay. <laughs> but uh, I, I, you hear animal stories like this of, of these creatures that present themselves as animals. Um, Mothman, various Bigfoot sightings. Dogman. Um, dog yeah, Dogman. That's another one. There's all kinds of these stories where these creatures kind of present themselves they usually don't hang out that long though they're usually there i'm here to mess with your head do something really freaky take off you know yeah. and they're very usually ominous they usually don't have the audacity to just sit around and be like yeah guess what you just adopted a talking ferret and um, <laughs> i'm gonna make your life hell you know and well i'm gonna go get you know usually it's well i'm gonna go get the neighbors and i'm gonna show them and this thing just appears to be like yeah i don't care <laughs> Go get them. <laughs> so, so, and then so, I'm going to talk like a chipmunk on helium. <laughs> so, so, Matt, when you watched the movie, what did the movie have any resemblance to the, the actual story? Almost none. That's one of the things that, like, really annoyed me about it. Like, yeah. if you just want to watch, like, a fun, quirky movie, yeah, it's fine. I mean, Simon Pegg's in it. I'd watch Simon Pegg in, like, an instructional video on putting up drywall. <laughs> <laughs> Fair. See, I enjoyed it, but I also didn't remember all the details of the Jeff story. So I'm going, how much of this is accurate? You know, that like that's the thing. Like the more it goes on, because I had the book beside me, because I was obviously prepping for the show while I was watching it, and like every couple minutes, I'm stopping and like flipping through the index trying to find things, and like almost the majority of what's in that movie is completely fictional, including like so many of the characters involved just utterly being made up and having no relation to anything that was going on. Of course. Yeah, that's not that's not unusual. Fire in the Sky was that way. Most most of your paranormal quote-unquote based movies based yeah. on a true story are like that, which is kind of annoying because a lot of the times the, the actual story itself is even weirder than what they're putting on the screen. But I think that's why. You yeah. know, you, you, you got a movie with Simon Pegg in it. You can't make it so weird that it's going to alienate people. But they were making it ostensibly as a comedy. And this is like one of the goofiest paranormal stories yeah. you could ever hope to find. Yeah. But how do you make it? Do you make it as a horror movie? Like, how do you, you know, did, did, did this thing ever do anything, you know, damaging or horrific like that? Did it kill anybody? Did it put anybody in any harm? Or was it just a pest? Speaking of killing things, one of the physical things that it did do fairly regularly was killing rabbits. Oh. And like it was doing this for one thing, the way it killed them was like so not animal like the rabbits were literally strangled, which again goes to Jeff having these weird, like almost human like hands. Yeah. But like as he was doing it, he would do that literally for the family. Like something I haven't touched on yet is they came. They were a fairly well off family. James was I forget specifically what, but he was a salesman, he had a fairly good living. They went to this farm in the Isle of Man because, like, he wanted to just be able to raise sheep or something. He basically just wanted to live on this small farm there. But, like, they were incredibly just, like, always in financial trouble, like, really just barely scraping by. And as Jeff would start killing these rabbits for them, it, like, not only greatly supplemented their food, but, like, he would kill them in such numbers that they were able to sell them, and, like, that became one of their main financial sources. I mean, there are worse pets to have. That's, <laughs> that's really Which, again, to, like, go back to the fairy thing, is related so much like cases of brownies, where they are these entities that would, like, do these little helpful things around the house when yeah. you take care of them. Yeah, clearly Ken's used to be like that, too. Uh, the leprechaun's little w- weird alcoholic cousin. <sighs> So, what I find interesting is it starts with um, that hostile sort of thing. Kind of like alien abductions start with this negativity. But if you work with it, it stops being so... Like, when you stop addressing it with fear, it stops being so scary. Mm -hmm. I gotta say, man, if, like... If this, well, I don't think something like that would happen in this day and age because there's so much stuff to document it. And hey, let me get my camera phone. Okay, talk, you know. But even then, if it did, people would be like, that's fake. Um, so I guess that's the catch 22 of it. But I mean, if there I, are if, like, photos if I, of them and they do say it's fake. Exactly. 
Um, well, I mean, so much of the stuff, the, the stuff that's the fake is the stuff that you hear about. The stuff that you can't prove is a fake. And that's the stuff that you kind of have to go digging for. That's the stuff that nobody really wants to talk about. But, um, I mean, if I had a death ferret and it talked like this and did this kind of stuff, I, I wouldn't be treating it like a ferret for very long. It'd be like, all right, well, you obviously know how to talk. You're, at, you're obviously sentient. You're not going away. You know, it'd be like, Jeff, go fetch me a beer after a little while, you know? <laughs> right. Like, I mean, once you accept that you've got a, a talking, you know, demonic Furby uh, death ferret or whatever in your house that's, that's doing weird stuff you kind of just have to roll along with them and do that. Or it's like, all right, well you can leave. But I mean, if it were cool, all right, well, welcome to the family, you know, just respect everybody and pull your share, I guess, or whatever. I don't know. Cause I mean, just imagine after a while, you'd be like, all right, Jeff, go, go love the dishwasher or something. You know? <laughs> <laughs> what? Um, so what about the investigators that looked into this? How did, how did they do, do so? I guess is what I'm looking for. So they tried a lot of different things, particularly trying to entice Jeff to like be willing to be photographed. That's one of the reasons they gave Vori the camera to try and take photos of him. So like they would have her try to photograph him. They would set up because there was this one little corner in the house that was like kind of his den sort of. They would like set up a camera thing like in a way that like Jeff would be able to take a photo of himself. But like even that didn't work like and he would Jeff would like argue with them saying like how hard it was to use the camera and like he couldn't reach with the cable or whatever they set up to like actually be in frame when he was taking the photo. Oh. And um, like another frustrating thing about it that like is either deliberately tricksterish or if you want to argue like was them trying to stage things was like Jeff would do all of these overt incredible things but like when he found out someone was coming a stranger someone from the town an investigator whoever he would like deliberately refuse to come out and tell them he was going to refuse to come out and just like not talk for weeks at a time and no one would see him and like until the investigators left and then he would start doing things again. Oh, huh, okay. They, 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 didn't they cover that a little bit in the movie? Like where he disappeared because they had a uh, photo out there. They kind of touch on it, but at the same time, the movie is like very heavily on the side of saying it was a hoax. So they like, don't really present, present it in a very sort of even way. Cause like there are so many things that like are like overtly not credible because like at one point they were trying to get plaster casts of his paw prints and these things are just comically bad like just looking at it you can tell one of them was from the family dog one of them looks like a child's art project it's so <laughs> badly sculpted but is, isn't that part of the nature of the whole thing anyway mm -hmm. like it could have been the legitimate jeff footprint but literally making it look ridiculous. Right. So it's hard It's hard to know where the actual hoaxing begins for attention and at what point it's just the weirdness of the phenomena keeping itself liminal. And this was weird, if nothing else. <laughs> well, yes. So uh, were Fodor and uh, the other investigator, were they, like, connected in any way? Uh, it was, <clears throat> excuse me, Harry Prince. Is it Prince or Price? I always forget. I think it's Prince. Uh, Prince. He was the initial one to go up there, spent quite a bit of time with them trying to get various bits of evidence. I think he did hear Jeff at one point, but he was the one that brought Fodor on later on to do his own investigation. So they were both did like fairly ex spent fairly extensive time up at the farm, but like not at the same time. It, it is price price. OK. I just looked it up. So, okay. So, but they were working sort of together. Yeah. And what, what were their conclusions? So, um, Price put out a book called The Haunting at Cashin's Gap, which I think he leaned more on the side of it. I'm trying to remember, like, even as I was reading it, I didn't want to, like, focus too much on the investigative side of it. Because, like, I think, and again, this is just me, like, having issues with that sort of material paranormal investigation type research. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That I can ramble on about that later if you want. <laughs> okay. So when it comes to not just Jeff in particular, but any sort of paranormal investigation research from either back then with the start of SPR up through now, there is always such a heavy emphasis on trying to prove the phenomena in a very literal material sense. True. And while 
that kind of knowledge can, it is valuable and it does have its place. It's also, at least in my more philosophical look at these things, missing the point of a lot of the phenomena. Like, And I can understand why so many, especially now, researchers and other casual enthusiasts of this have that view of things and want to lean on that crutch because the way our just culture in general is oriented, that kind of materialist proof in a sense like is the only way they see of offering a legitimacy to so many of these topics. But like if you want to prove that a mountain exists, all you have to do is turn around and look at it. If you want to know about the mountain, there are a dozen different disciplines from geology to studying the flora and fauna that you can learn about what that mountain is to minute detail. If you want to actually understand a mountain, you need a poet. You need to talk to the people that have lived in its shadow for generations. You need to see the art of the people whose lives have been affected by it. And I think that's what the real focus of paranormal research in general should be, because it is so, while it is incredibly widespread and something that affects virtually everyone, it is of its nature an incredibly intimate and personal phenomena. It is unique to you and messages for you. So like trying to have these like broader investigations to have like a specific material answer of like x is y it's like so it can be valuable knowledge but it's also just at least in my view missing the point of the phenomena itself and and i would fully agree with that um and we've talked about that before uh because you're reluctant to talk about some of your experiences simply because they're personal to you Mm -hmm. yeah i can relate to that (laughs) And I mean, a lot of mine are all personal to me too. And I'll just take out some of that, uh, some of those details, you know, like because I want people to be able to relate um, if they're having similar stuff happen to them, uh, but without you know compromising that, you know, like this this meaning is just for me. This isn't for anyone else. <laughs> the um, so in the book, I, I, when I was flipping through the index real quick, I saw there was a, a reference to Lovecraft, which I was wasn't sure where that was going to go, but it says arguably the greatest influence of the Jeff mystery upon fictional work may be seen in Lovecraft's short story, The Dreams of the Witch House. It was written in January and February 1932 at a time when reports of the Dorlish Passion Enigma, which I didn't realize it was called that, uh, were beginning to appear in British and foreign newspapers. The story tells of Walter Gilman, who experiences disturbing dreams while living in the Garrett Gable flat of an old house in the fictional New England town of Arkham. Gilman learns that a former occupant of the abode was a witch whose familiar was named Brown Jenkin. Brown Jenkin is said to be no larger than a good-sized rat, the fruit of a remarkable case of sympathetic heart herd delusion, for in nineteen or 1692, no, no less than 11 persons had testified to glimpsing it. Witnesses said it had long hair and the shape of a rat, rat but that its sharp-toothed bearded face was evilly human, while its paws were like tiny human hands. Its voice was kind of a loathsome titter, and it could speak all languages. So yeah, that kind of sounds like Jeff. Mm-hmm. Sounds yeah, like I familiar. actually remember... Had re- reading that Lovecraft Familiar. story so many years ago, and like didn't make that connection until I saw it in the book. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, well, that Lo- house had um, a, a monster or something buried in the basement of it, if I remember correctly. In a Lovecraft story, no, no, no. <laughs> well, no, they start digging in the basement, and they come across what appears to be a gigantic, enormous leg or something like that, if I remember correctly. It's been years since I've read that story. Uh, <clears throat> the witch house one. Yeah, is that the one with the? Is that the one that had the creature buried in the basement or whatever? And they were digging in the basement and they found it. I don't or part of part that. of the creature, and that was what was supposedly gave the house its power or something like that. I don't remember. It's been years. I know there's H.P. Lovecraft people out there right now, like throwing a fit because mm-hmm. I should know this and I don't remember it now. I don't even remember that at all. And I mean, I've read everything of Lovecraft, but it's been a while since I've read anything from Lovecraft yeah. because I've read them all, you know. So. Hmm. So let me ask you, you said there was a whole other variety of just completely bonker stuff that was going on as well, besides besides the, the, the talking mongoose, if that wasn't enough. So what was some of the other strange things that were happening? Like, what's what's the weirdest thing you can remember coming out of this? Weirder than Jeff himself. Um, I was about to say weirder than Jeff himself, but I didn't want to. <laughs> I didn't want to add to it. So like uh, like what okay he go, he went out and hunted rabbits and stuff like that great he's earning his keep um 
you know, like what other what did did you have like roofs flying off of houses or you you said things were apparating and disappearing and going from one spot to another or something like that? Yeah, he would move things like there was um in his little like hidey hole den, whatever, there was a chair that was like just up on a cabin or whatever. And he would say he was doing his exercises, moving the chair around. Like if you can imagine a creature the size of a little squirrel moving a giant wooden chair back and forth. Yeah, there rocket were, raccoon carrying a couch. Yeah. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> there were like loud noises and bangs that would happen throughout the house. There were, like I said, stone throws. He would urinate through the walls. He would. It was okay because you got him rabbits. Right. He would kill rabbits. He would. Some of the things that he would describe or not describe, but like if you want to think of it in terms of Jeff being this physical creature, I guess this would be akin to bilocating. Like he would there would be several instances where he would be ostensibly inside the house talking with one of them. But would it simultaneously be aware of conversations happening miles away and would be able to recite them perfectly to whoever he was talking to or like relating these things from like in he would be like out in the wilderness talking with Vori at the same time that he would know what was happening back at the house, whatever they were doing there. He would. What else? Like I said, there was the time he like described the interior of this mansion that none of them had ever been to. So trying to think of what else. W- w- was the reciting of the poetry from the movie in there at all? No, that's another thing that is so frustrating. Not only did that reciting the poem never happen, that person like just doesn't exist. That was wow. someone they made up for the movie, which itself is so like frustrating because this obviously is not just that but like this is you know a very poor rural community that like itself is the type of people that like would struggle to be taken seriously by you know air quote big city outsiders like the family that was there but then you like have this movie portraying them as like these you know alcoholic hicks that like i mean the story with that character about reciting the poem this is literally right after a scene of him pulling his pants down and urinating in a church yeah, cemetery yeah. during his wife's funeral. I'm like, why invent something like that? That is so insulting to the people that like actually live in that community. It's like yeah. this is the way you're portraying them. Okay. So did I hear you right when it, you said that it was at someone's funeral and it was urinating? No, no, that was okay. like one of the scenes in the movie. The first, ah, okay. like one of the okay. few locals they actually talked to in the movie is okay. this character that supposedly heard Jeff talking during his wife's funeral. It shows him at the funeral, just drunk out of his mind, wandering around the side of the church, like right in front of everyone, dropping his pants to pee right there on the graves. Okay. And like, that is when he heard Jeff talking and like, like conceptually, I get it. That is a nice, ridiculous, funny scene. But like when you're trying to portray real people and something that really happened to a community, Throwing something like that in is just insulting. Yeah. What 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 did the the people of the community make of it? Did people believe it? Again, it was such a mixed bag. Some people would believe it and think Jeff was this real physical thing. Some of them treated the whole phenomena just like sort of a haunting. Others would say it's a complete hoax and they were all just faking everything. There like is no consistent narrative about what was going on, even among the people that were like immediately surrounded by it. Which makes was sense. anybody in the family like a ventriloquist or anything? Did they actually have any talents or anything like that? That is something that gets leveled against Vori. Like some people that knew her said she had this incredible ventriloquist ability. But there's no evidence that she ever had access to learn anything about that. She denies it completely. Other people in that same peer group that knew her said she never knew anything about or did anything like that. Vori herself as an adult would said that like if she had that kind of talent, she would have used it to get famous just from that so she could afford to leave the farm. Like it's not simple, just like everything else related to all of this. So now that you've looked into this and all this, the books, and you've you've done further research on it, there's no wrong answer to this question. But in your opinion, what do you think or believe or have an idea of what this could have actually have been? Demons. Really? 
No, I'm just trying to make Soraya. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that would that answer would fit here on this show. So I was just going to ask you to elaborate on that. So, but no, but what do you think this was? Do you think it was a hoax? Do you think it was some kind of a? Um, do you think it was some kind of a cryptid? Do you think it was some kind of fey thing? Or you know, where do you lie in all this? So, you know, based off what you've read, the only thing I'm willing to say for certain is that as even though there are different things like the plaster cast and that that are almost certainly fakes of some sort, mm. the phenomena as a whole, I'm willing to say, wasn't a hoax just because there were so many things documented from so many different sources. There was something going on. What would actually be like? I'm not even sure what category to put something like this yeah. and to say like, oh, it was, you know, X, Y, Z phenomena. It's like, I'm pretty sure he wasn't like an alien, but like outside of that. Well, let's take a quick break and we'll be right back. All right. Quick mid show break here. Contact info. Everything is at where did the road go.com. So all the links, all the shows back to the very first one, they're all there. Uh, and uh, you can listen anytime you want. If you want to become a patron, it's the best way to help us out. It's only $3 a month. It helps out a lot. And um, you get extra content every week, and you get the show a week early. Other ways you can help out, of course, uh, giving us ratings, sharing us with your friends, and so forth. I also do a heavy music show that focuses on underground and independent artists for the most part. Stuff you're not going to hear anywhere else that is actually really good. And you can find that at thelastexit.org. It covers metal and punk and industrial and gothic stuff, and it's all over the place. And finally, a recommendation for this week. I'm going to go with Late Night with the Devil. Numerous people told me I would like it. They were right. I don't think I liked it as much as everyone else did. Um, there's a lot of nods to The Exorcist. I'm not a big fan of that type of horror, but it was very well done. Really, really well done. I, and I did really enjoy it, and I would highly recommend it. It was a, a fun watch. That is out on AMC Plus, and I guess you can rent it on Prime as well. So if you want to check that out, that's how to do it. It's a good movie, worth the time, and uh, it seems like people really enjoy it. So cool. All right, back to the show. So we are talking about Jeff the Mongoose tonight on uh, Where Did the Road Go? Um, if I have a chance to read this book, I may see if we can get the author on as well. But it's Jeff, The Strange Tale of an Extra Special Talking Mongoose by Christopher Joseph, I think. Could be Joseph, but it's J-O-S-I-F-F-E. So Maybe he'll hear us talking about it and say, hey, I, I want to come on the show and talk to you guys. Yeah, apparently I'm following him on Twitter. So uh, I didn't even realize. I looked him up uh, during the break and uh, yeah, I, I, I already follow him on Twitter, so... But it's it's a thick book to get through, and I have a few others I absolutely have to read first. But, and uh, write. Huh? And write. Yeah, yeah, we're getting there with that. Slowly. I keep... <coughs> anyway. You know, Slowly. Maybe, maybe, maybe we'll talk about... We'll talk about that in the Patreon as well. Um... So any, anyway, um, as far as Jeff goes, we were talking about possibilities here. But I mean, to me, this seems like the the like 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 the Mothman. You had a lot of different stuff going on that was probably um, interconnected, but looked different. You know, so you have the poltergeist stuff. You have, of course, the trickster stuff. You have probably some of the hoaxing and stuff. You have what seems to be a cryptid, uh, some fey connections. Obviously, the poltergeist stuff kind of kind of goes through all of it, so it's kind of a given. But, uh, I mean, I don't think it was an actual cryptid. Um, it, I think it's a cryptid in the way that a Class B Bigfoot is a cryptid, you know, in the sense that this thing has been either created as a tulpa or it's something that we don't understand, but once it gets a form, it keeps, keeps retaining that form to some degree, at least for a while. I mean, it was cryptid in the sense that, like, it presented as an animal, like, not yeah. cryptid in, like, the materialist sense of, like, an undiscovered species of something. Right, right. And, I, and again, this is what I think a lot of Bigfoot encounters are, and a lot of a lot of other strange monster encounters are, is that they are basically something that, that has enough energy to create a physical form. It's not that they're not physical creatures, they're just not permanent physical creatures. So people can see Jeff the Mongoose, um, and they can interact with it. You know, she can supposedly touch its teeth, but it may not exist all the time, at least not as a physical entity. Plus, it shows ESP. Yeah, this all screams trickster. 
every, every bit of it. The, the, this, oh, yeah. All of this screams fade to me. I could totally see why why Kutch knew about this. This has everything that he pings in on and th- that we pay attention to. Well, this was famous But when you said demon, I'm like, no, demon is a, a viable answer here. If you believe in demons. If you believe in demons. Um, or if you believe in fae. Well, right. Like, to me, fae Or if you just... believe in mongooses. <laughs> right. If you believe in mongooses. That's the problem I have here. I have... <laughs> I have yet to see a dead body of a mongoose, so I don't even know if they're real or not. You would think, you know, anyways. I, I, I think, you know, and, and people have said this before. It's like, oh, you believe in, in Faye, but you don't believe in nuts and bolts UFOs. It's like, I don't really believe in Faye specifically as like physical existing Faye. I think there's there are good descriptors in Faye lore that explain better what we're interacting with than a lot of other stuff. It's not that I literally believe in the Faye as they're presented. It's just a good descriptor. It's kind of like when I talk about Kundalini. I mean, there's, there's other practices that are similar to Kundalini. I just feel like Kundalini is is the term that represents it best. It's not the only term or the only way to look at it. It fits um, because human beings and the way that our brains work, and I was doing this earlier, we want everything to try to fit into boxes as much as possible. Oh, yeah, yeah. And this was kind of part of the reason like where I kind of came to this whole thing with paranormal where I was talking off the air where a lot of it doesn't hold as much interest anymore because I've kind of just gotten to this point in my life where I'm like weird things happen I'm never going to understand what they are we probably never will understand what they are and for me to try to sit down and organize all this stuff and God bless people like Josh and Greg and all these people that do Nick Redfern, and all these people that try to put this stuff together and present it in some way shape or form where this is just another the Jeff the Talking Mongoose. If, if this thing was real, there's no, it doesn't fit in any one kind of particular no. box. I say it, it, to me, it presents itself as a fae. This seems, if it's real, it seems very much it was just like this fae thing came along and said, I'm just going to mess with these people. And then it got bored and went away. You know, that's that's what it feels like to me. It doesn't seem demonic or no. evil. But, uh, but initially, as as Matt was saying, it came across as pretty pretty uh, nasty. Um, well, it has to establish that, that again. These are that's how these things present themselves. They have to establish some kind of dominance or something like that to establish I'm more powerful than you. I am greater than you. Don't screw with me. Having said that, you know. <clears throat> There's a there's a bit in the movie where where I think Fodor's talking to the thing through the wall and they're not really letting him check it or whatever like he can kind of see fur moving but he's not sure if it's real or not um, but it goes into this almost Lovecraftian spiel all of a sudden I'm like okay I don't know if that actually happened but that was cool oh yeah like that scene itself didn't happen like nothing like that was at least in the book recorded that way but like a lot of the things Jeff says in the movie especially like the really goofy over the top stuff actually are quotes from him. Okay. Like even though the scene with the phone call never happened, a lot of what he said, like referring to himself as the eighth wonder of the world. And if you saw him, you'd turn into like a pillar of salt. Those kind of things he like are some of the things that like Jeff actually said and are on par with the incredibly like grandiose way he would talk about himself. Huh. Okay. That's cool. I, I, I remember, you know, from, from, because I never read a full book on it, I would just read accounts of the case. Um, you know, I remember the stuff about him being able to talk about what was going on in town when he wasn't there and they were able to verify it later. Um, I, I'm, I'm trying to remember what else stood out to it, stood out about it. Uh, to me, but again, there there are comparisons here to the Mothman. When you're talking about like Ro, when you talk about it being like Fay, Mothman represents kind of like a UFO thing or a cryptid thing, depending on which way you're looking at it. But but it, Mothman has similar to this too in a lot of yeah. ways, where you have uh, when he was in the hotel. And he was getting the phone calls. Yeah. But it later came out that I can't remember who they who he said it was. It was across the street calling his hotel from the payphone or something. But that parallels with this, where it's like, well, yeah, it could have. This was weird. This was happening weird. But this is happening, and this could have been fake. So therefore, the whole thing could have been fake. There's always just this little element of something that's fake in there that mm-hmm. likes to kind of just pee on the whole thing and ruin it. So I keep cutting you off. Go ahead. I wonder if they ever sampled the pee. The what, pee? Is, no, that was like. Is there some kind of a fetish going on here tonight, guys? <laughs> well, if it's pe- but if it's peeing through the wall, I'm not into your personal life. That, 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 <laughs> I'm not king shaving. 
That, that, you know, that would be like collecting Bigfoot scat. You know, you'd have something to analyze. Nobody back then would have done something like that. That's one of the things that, like, really frustrated me about this. Because, like, they had multiple different hair samples taken from, ostensibly from Jeff. Some that, like, Jeff said he collected himself. They're like, when they examined those, they all came back as just dog fur. But, like, they also, like, had him literally peeing through the walls. Like, no one thought to try and collect that to see what that was. Yeah. Like, I know, you know, it's, like, pre-World War II. Like, chemical analysis and whatever would be very limited compared to now. But still, you could, like, get some idea of what it was. You got to put yourself into the frame of mind, though, that these people were poor. This was out in the countryside. This was a different time. The, the paranormal people that were out there, I mean, yes, you had spiritualism and stuff like that going on, but it was a very different time. And these things just they, like now it's why I was saying earlier. Nowadays, I don't think anything like this could ever remotely happen because it would be like for what we're saying right now fur pee. But OK, what is you know, everything can be done with genetics now or whatever, or it's just going to come back unknown, li- you know, un- unknown life form or whatever it is, yeah, yeah. Um, which that's a conversation me and Ritzman had on the air once, too. Um, but it's, it's just for us to say, why, why didn't they do this? Why didn't they do that? I could totally see them not doing this stuff at the time because it's just not, this wasn't science back then. There was no, there was no science to this. The people that were in, in the infancy of it were like your spiritualists and psychic researchers and, um, like the international Institute for, um, uh, the international Institute for psychic research were a couple of people that were there. Cause you dropped somebody's name from it earlier. And I, I had known a little bit about them, but they were the only ones that were out there doing this kind of stuff. And I'm sure they didn't have the money to send things off for lab analysis. You know, what are you going to, so when you say, I mean, I'm not defending them, but I can, I can, I can respect why they probably did some of the things that they did. Plus, I mean, you need, you're going to collect the urine. Where are you going to send it to? Because the technology wasn't the same. And what are you going to tell them? Like, I, yeah. I just had this thing peeing through my wall. I want to know what this is. Right, sir. You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> It's pee. Okay, great. So thanks. I, yeah, it's urine. Okay, it's it smells like urine. <laughs> so I, I can I, – I, this stuff was – if it was – again, this stuff, if it were faked, would be a lot easier to pull off back then. Like even the pictures you had with the girls with the fairies and stuff like that, um, the fairies on the sticks and yeah, that yeah. old thing and how later mm-hmm. on that was proven. But that, that was probably the state-of-the-art you know, research back then or what have you. So no, no one got a picture of, of uh, Jeff, right? Yeah, actually there are, and they're in the book. There are really? several photos supposedly of Jeff. Like, but again, and a lot of this has to do with just like the quality of photography at the time and the like, far less than ideal conditions they were taken under. You can like see something that looks kind of like a small furry animal, but like there's no... Like, you can't, like, look at it and say, oh, yeah, that's very definitely a talking mongoose. Yeah, there's a lot of pictures in this book, too. Yeah, here, let me flip through. Because they're, like, the clearest yeah. one they actually did show in the movie two, of where he's sitting on. Two alleged photographs of Jeff sitting in a distinctly cat-like form, although there is clearly a tail to be seen in one of them, unlike a tailless Manx cat. Yeah. But even still, you know... Part of my brain goes to skepticism and part of my brain goes to believer. I'm always in this dichotomy back and forth. But if I were to see a picture, I'd probably be like, okay, that's a picture of a ferret or or it's a picture of a creature sitting in a chair that wouldn't I would have to see it or something to validate it for my own eyes. Sure, sure. I mean, that's the thing. Pictures are not proof of anything. And, And especially nowadays. But even back then, I mean, yeah. It's, pictures yeah. are if you're if you're skilled enough, you can create fake pictures fairly easily. See the talking mongoose thing that that doesn't has me as doesn't have me as fascinated as as the rest of the phenomena surround the odd phenomena surrounding the mongoose itself, because you go back to these are these 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 things don't go like one of these things is not like the other. So, okay, you got a talking mongoose, but the stones that were flying around the house were that was the mongoose present when the stones were flying around the house. Um, when, when the mongoose wasn't there, what kind of things were happening when the mongoose wasn't there? You know, and there, there's so many avenues you could go. It's like you said, Topa is one of them, but Topa and flying stones and pee coming out of the walls, like that stuff is more like, like a haunting poltergeist possession 
kind mm-hmm. of thing. Mm-hmm. Whereas just the talking mongoose is, hi, I'm a talking mongoose. What's up? I'm going to get you some rabbits. Well, you remember, know? remember, you can have ghosts that appear in physical form, too, during poltergeist cases. Great. Now it makes it even weirder, because why does a poltergeist present itself as a talking mongoose mm-hmm. of all things? Yep. Yep. That's, that, that's the thing that makes this case stand out, because it's so ridiculous. It fits into that high strangeness category. Like, if you're going to fake it, why would you make up a talking mongoose? Yeah, it's like, were they, were they sitting around like, <laughs> okay, I got an idea. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to make a talking mongoose and, because and we're poor. Did, did, and, uh, but they weren't poor, were they? Yeah, like, they didn't, at least, again, this is my badly recounting a book I finished reading a while ago. They were, like, fairly well off, but, like, after they moved there over time, like, their financial situation got worse. And, like, that actually became a fairly sizable point of contention between James and the investigators, because, like, they were, the investigators, profiting from, like, having all these different papers and things published at the time about Jeff. But they, like, wouldn't give him any money from this because, like, they didn't want it to seem compromised from James, like, profiting off of this story. But he, at the same time, has come to them like, guys, I'm barely making ends meet. You promised me something from right. this. And I know, beside the point, this is going to be terrible radio, but Soraya, if you turn to page 110, I think those are some of the clearest photos of Jeff, where it's like very obviously something furry sitting on a fence, but it's like so poor quality of a photo and out of focus that like you can't even say specifically what it is. I think that's the one I looked at, actually. That sounds, yep. Oh, no, that's not the one I looked at. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. It almost looks like a bird. Kind of, yeah. Like it's like just sort of hunched over like that. Yeah. Okay. Again, great radio. <laughs> Well, people will have to pick up the book. Um, but it's still fun to hear you guys each describe it in your own way. It's kind yeah. of like the, the blind people being led to the elephant saying, tell me what this is. <laughs> <laughs> well, this in, in this case, this picture not, not only kind of shaped like a bird to me, but it uh, it looks like it's multicolored, where the other one I was looking at looked like it was brown. Because they're black and white photos, obviously. Yeah. So that, that's I'm trying to see there. which other photo you were looking at, because there's so many photos in this book. Yes, the, bo- the book the Photos weren't exactly Polaroids back then either. Right. Yeah. yeah. The book is beautiful, though. Uh, it's, it's very well put together. Um, I, I, I assume you, you would recommend the book, Matt? Oh, absolutely. It's very well written. It's incredibly well researched and detailed. It is extensively documented and like i said so many photographs of like not just like not just like the few photos of jeff that there are but like of the family of the area of like different newspaper clippings at the time of different articles related to him it is like so well researched and easy to read like that's a problem i have with a lot of paranormal related books as you can tell it's something that like someone just threw together and tossed out there to print with like yeah. not being yeah. the most articulate writer in the world. Like, you know, Josh Kutchin is the incredibly rare unicorn that is like so incredible at research and also just a brilliant writer in yeah. his own right. They're like, yeah. that's a hard standard to live up to. But like, this is one of the few paranormal books that is just like, even if you have no interest in exploring the phenomena whatsoever, it's just a really fun read. Mm. And it won some award too. The, uh, Did we ever finish off? Talking about what you actually thought this stuff was, I think that was where we were before we took the break. I don't remember. Yeah, well, yeah, we did. Uh, winner of Folklore okay. Society Catherine Briggs Award. Because he was joking about it being demons initially, and then we talked mm-hmm. about yeah. the, the different aspects okay. of what it could be. Um, I think one of the difficulties with trying to fit a story like this into any of the available boxes we have to categorize this kind of phenomena is those categories themselves are all just various attempts that have developed over the ages to try and explain these things that like the phenomena itself is not going to fit perfectly into any one of them right because like that's not what it is the each of the different explanations like be it poltergeist failure or anything like that they're each of them are not literal explanations so much as they are common languages and some of those languages are better suited at describing different phenomena yes yes and that's the problem i mean you get so so much stuff that gets ignored because it doesn't fit into whatever box someone's looking at 
So, hey, you had a Bigfoot encounter. Well, don't mention the UFO, you know? Mm -hmm. And if you do, then both sides, because you've got the Bigfoot people like, yeah, Bigfoot. And then you mention the UFO and the UFO people like, yeah, UFO. But when in actuality, they're kind of like, it kind of marginalizes it. So neither one of them actually wants to talk about it. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I feel like, like well, pre- that might have just been the Northern Lights or something like that. But there was a Bigfoot there. And it's like, well, <laughs> th- we think that the Bigfoot came out of the UFO, but there was definitely a UFO there. And maybe <laughs> what they saw, they thought they saw. That's that's how they always kind of explain it away. And and I <laughs> and I think this this trying to pigeonhole things into preconceived notions is why the the research into this stuff kind of stagnated eventually. You know, like we didn't get any further. We just started like sort of reproducing the same results over and over. It's like, oh, look, here's a Bigfoot cast. Great. We got tons of these. What does this prove? Yeah. You know, like, yeah, uh, you know, here's here's a blurry picture of a UFO. Cool. That doesn't help us anything. You know, like there, there's nothing that has come from that type of thinking anymore that is taking us any further. We've already gone down those paths as far as they're going to take us. And we've well, the got other a- problem is the technology has caught up to the world of the paranormal. So now it's very easy to fake. go in and fake a video. Yeah, it or, really is. You know, I mean, back when, again, Ritzman, we used to talk about faking photos, and he'd be like, well, this is how you find them. You go in in the layers, and you do this, and you do that. But mm-hmm. he himself, and this was back when he was still around, he said, yeah, it's becoming harder and harder because the tech's becoming better and better. So at this point, unless it's a mass sighting, and it's taken from all kinds of different angles, from different people on different cell phones and different things like that, then yeah, then that that's the only thing you can really look into and go, okay, maybe there might be something to this, but just because the tech is the way it is, you, you have to be suspect now, yeah. especially now with AI coming into the picture. And I mean, you know, even back, you know, years ago, in fact, I just heard Jeff and Jeremy talk about this on a recent, uh, one of the uh, paratopias that uh, Jeremy uploaded was the Jerusalem UFO, which was taken mm-hmm. from like three different cell phones, you know, or whatever, uh, and turned out to be completely fake. Yeah, yeah, because if you're going to sit down and you really want to fake something, that would be the way to do it. Be like, yeah. okay, we need to make five different videos from five different angles. But now with the creation of AI, that makes that tremendously easier. Um, but like the, uh, the old Chicago O'Hare photos and things like that, those are, those were a little bit different. Yeah. Those um, are interesting. Like, yeah. Yeah. Like Gulf Coast, Gulf Coast now. Gulf Breeze. You wouldn't even, Gulf Breeze, I'm sorry. Gulf Breeze wouldn't even get, get, I do that all the time. I get things wrong, but it would, um, I told you I was going to do that too. <laughs> but nowadays, if you were to see videos like that, like th- if you were to see Jeffrey, the talking mongoose nowadays, it, it, there'd, there'd be no way. You know, there would just be no way anybody would believe it. So it's kind of squashed the paranormal, which if the paranormal is a thing and if the trickster is a thing, it's kind of giving it permission. Okay, go run wild because now no one's going to be able to prove whatever you are actually exists. Right, right. (laughs) So I had a thought kind of about that. I can't remember. I know I told Sarai about it. I can't remember if I mentioned it on a show or not. That like as the various media technologies have advanced, especially with things like AI and before that as Photoshop got incredibly more powerful and all this, as it becomes so much easier to fake or just create any sort of image you can think of, that inherently breeds the just innate doubt of what you're looking at. But so much of this phenomena plays with that like constant uncertainty and disbelief. I wonder if in a way that would actually make photos or whatever kind of documentation you're thinking of easier to obtain and see because inherently so few people would believe what they're looking at. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'd have to say it would. It could go both ways, really. Yeah. It, it, it could. If you're, it's, it's like politics. If you're in one camp, you're in that camp. There's not much. There's very few people that, or what? What did Greg say? The um, the un unregulated middle, or something like that. I can't remember what what his oh, term used uh, to be for. Oh, I got so a few. Wrong, I can't remember what it is. You know what I'm talking yes. about, Greg? Yeah. If you're out there, I'm sorry. I'm butchering the term. Um, it's one of the reasons why I have such respect for Greg and Jeff and all those guys because these people are truly are kind of in the middle of it. Um. But uh, it's you have the people that are in the middle that are like, well, this could be real. That can't like with me. I try to whenever I see a video on TikTok or whatever, I always just just like by nature, how can I disprove this? How if I wanted to do this and I wanted to fake it, how would I do it? And every once in a while, I'll come across something that I can't disprove in my own head, and you know, and when I can, I'm like, okay, cool. There might be something to this one. I'm not I'm not looking for something to be fake because I want it to be fake. 
because I don't believe in this stuff. I'm doing it because I'm I'm trying to find things that are possibly real and there might be a nugget of something to it or whatever. Right. Exactly. And those are the things that I gravitate to. But 90% of what I see out there, I'm like, like my buddy's like, check this out. This guy's in a hallway and the door closes here and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, well, yeah, you could do that really easy with the grade of the camera, the footage, the color and everything. You could do that really easy with fishing line by running it around the yeah. corner of the wall yeah. and having it tied to the doorknob, you know. Just stuff like that, you know? Excluded metal. That's Excluded metal. That's what it was. Thank you. Good good catch. Um, um, well, but the thing is, like, the problem is, yes, these things happen. Like, sometimes doors slam. Yeah. So, it's like, we don't really need footage to know that this stuff happens. But when you get the footage, it's kind of like, yeah, it's also easy to fake. So, unless exactly. you've experienced it... You really don't know. You Correct. Either, you either have to just believe somebody, or you have to have the experience yourself, in which case then you're like, okay, I can't explain that. You know, I know I didn't fake it because it happened to me, and, you know, I'm I'm by myself, and there's no one around, so, okay, why did that happen? You get to a point where you know, everybody wants the photo or the video so they can be like, look, this is real. It's a UFO, yeah, or it's a yeah. Bigfoot, or it's blah, blah. You know, you want to get that photo or that video or whatever it is, that piece of evidence you want to get to try to convince people. And anymore, I just don't think that's a feasible thing. If you're going to – most of the time when people have an experience, like, what do I do? I'm like, well, I don't – if I were you, I wouldn't tell anybody because no one's going to believe you. They're going to think you're nuts. But, uh, <laughs> you know, it's like you're not going to prove this to anybody. So it comes down to your own decision. Do you think this is real or do you think this stuff is real or do you think it's not real? Uh, like, like, and, like Matt said, it also tends to have a very personal sort of thing going on. Exactly. Yeah. And like that is like the entire drive to have that kind of, you know, definitive proof, something you can show to other people, be it a photograph, a video, whatever. Like the desire to have something like that. I at least the way I see things is less about proving a phenomena as much as it is that person wanting to have their personal experiences legitimized in the eyes of others because they right. aren't being believed. Right. Exactly. Yeah. All right. We're yeah. out of time. So we'll do a patron and talk to a uh, Patreon segment and have Rojan relay his dog story and I'll explain what's going on with the book. Uh, but where can people find you, Rojan? Right now, I sometimes co-host on a show called Old Nerds Drinking, which is total nerd show, Star Wars, Star Trek, you know, nerd stuff. And we usually are having a beer or something at the time. Um, Archivist is still out there. The episodes are still up at projectarchivist.com. Um, I'm going to try to get it back up and running. I've got a couple of shows that I want to do. It's just a matter of, of sitting down and pressing the record button and button and doing the editing and all that kind of stuff. It's just a matter of me sitting down and actually doing it, but I am getting the itch and I do, I, I do want to do some stuff again. So, you know, hopefully I'll have that fired back up. I actually brought everything from the studio where the studio was up into this new room that I've totally redesigned. And this is the first show that I'm recording from that room, ironically. Nice. So, you know, we'll see what happens, but yeah, projectarchivist.com. If you want to find, uh, I also run a bad movie group that, uh, I think we talked about, which is at cinema, La bad on Facebook. Uh, it's just B movies, classic movies. We, Weird movies, stuff like that. Uh, that's another one of my big obsessions and interests and things like that. So you can find me, find me there, and find me at the Project Archivist Facebook page. All right, and Matt, where can people find your art? Or I'm going to say awesome artwork, so you can you can tell me I'm wrong. Ah, I'll let it slide this time. <laughs> you can find next time. My artwork there. sucks. You got it. <laughs> crap! It's all crap. You can see my art on Facebook, Instagram, and Blue Sky everywhere. It's under Tiamat's Garden. If you want to hear me rambling about nonsense, you can find me either here or on The Last Exit for the Lost. I'm on either of these places much more frequently than I post art. <laughs> That's true, I guess. All right. Thank you both. No problem. Thank you. I want to take a moment here to thank all of my patrons, especially those of you pledging $10 or more, because you're the ones that keep making this show possible. So my thanks to Greg Ross, Illuminati, Cara Henryson, John Blackburn, Madeline J, Matt in Delaware, Allison Cook, 36 Dingo, Tim, Andrew Nichols, Matthew Sproul, Midnight Review presents Christine, a blue second gen MR2 drifting around a Japanese mountain. Patricia Guy Quinta, Alex Whitcomb, American Rambler, Andrew Maines, Andrew Malone, Ann Witowski, Barbara Fisher, Beverly Williamson, Big Boy Limina, Bright Rectangle, Charles Davis, Charles in Florida, the land of the crazy and communicable, CJ, Craig Parmenter, Diane B, MTK, Eric Citron, Eric Todd, History and Coffee, 
Jay, Jay Otto Bullet, Jack Huntington, James Lindsay, Jim and Sophie, John Mattingly, John Bracken, John Hewling, Carla Mahoney, Kevin, Kevin Shrek, Cool Kitty, Kristen L, Laser Printer Jam, Lauren McLean, Rachel Wahlberg, Corey Nelson, Linda, Linz Jackson K, MJ Armstrong, Mark Brady, Mr. Weird, Oli Andre Olar, Paul Jeffries, Perry Peters, Philosopher of Mirrors, Riker and Stark, Roland Belstadt, Ron Dupre, Sam Sharon, Sarah Horgan, Schmooples, Devourer of Mortal Souls, Stacy, Stacy Sherwood, Stevie Norman, Strange Stories with the Seeker and Skeptic Podcast, Tactical Therapist, Taylor Bell, the Esoteric Book Club Podcast, Thunderboy, Tyler Glimstead, Veroch K, Victoria, Vincent Trewell, Will Gebhard, Will Powell, Ren Collier, Annabelle Smith, Caroline Walker, TDT Skunkworks, Colin Karras, and Craig Sagastumi. Thank you all so very, very much. All right, there's a Patreon segment to go along with this, and uh, that's that gets really long and goes in a completely different direction than everything we just talked about here. So, uh, yeah, patrons will get that very soon. If you want to become a patron, it's only $3 a month. And you can go to wheredotheroadgo.com and click on the Patreon link, and you'll get extra content almost every week, and the show a week early, and extra stuff as well. Um, I do want to welcome a new patron, Rachel Wahlberg, and I want to correct my pronunciation from last week. I want to welcome Cecily Meland. I hope I said it right this time. I apologize for that. All right. See you next time. You have been listening to Where Did the Road Go? This show is made possible in part from our Patreons, and we thank you and everyone listening for helping us continue this exploration of the strange. You can always find everything Where Did the Road Go related at www.wheredidtheroadgo.com. And thank you so much for your support.